Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Global Connections. Today, we're going to talk about the global intelligence community and what role does it play in, in uh, geopolitics. Now, there's plenty of it going around. For this discussion, Dr. Rubati Kandakar, she's a geopolitical strategist who joins us um, frequently to discuss these kinds of issues. Today, she's going to help us understand uh, the role of national intelligence agencies and their methodologies for gathering vetting and interpreting intelligence for strategic planning and dissemination and collaboration with other intelligence agencies in other countries. Uh, welcome to the show, Rubati. It's always nice to see you. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show. And it's lovely to be here. Well, this is an important discussion, you know, because we, we keep hearing at the fringes, you know, the intelligence agencies are strong and smart and they have good technology and they're all over the place and maybe they do good things or bad things or they don't do anything at all when they should be. Um, so we should examine who they are, what they are, and whether they are effective and, 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 and the role they play in all the headline uh, stories about geopolitics and war and what have you. So what have you learned? So Jay, uh, we hear it in the news that there is intelligence failure these kind of words that keep popping up and uh, you kind of wonder and somebody asks you like, you, you, what is intel? So, uh, you know, that kind of thing has come into the picture when we saw the head of uh, uh, the intelligence wing in um, Israel uh, resign after the October 7 attack. It was a failure of intelligence. So what it is, uh, that becomes the question when it hits uh, headlines, you know. So every, every, every government has this intelligence unit. And uh, in the US, we have the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And he has under three, three categories, you have uh, you know, services, you have uh, each of the armed forces have an intelligence unit in there. Uh, and J, it's not just about uh, gathering information. You know, it's such a multifaceted, uh, wing that we have or multifaceted uh, organization, they analyze major drug cartels and uh, the counter drug offensive that there is. They have information on foreign nuclear uh, uh, assets and your uh, foreign assets abroad. They have analysis for the Secretary of State that the foreign ambassador and his ambassadors, uh, for, uh, sec uh, foreign um, minister and his uh, ambassadors. You have terrorism and financial uh, information that is shared. So these are the broad aspects. And uh, it makes you realize that they work in almost every part of uh, geopolitics, international geopolitics. Now their uh, task is not only just to collect information, but also to analyze the information and uh, give the information in such a way to the administrative authorities that they can make policies based on that. They can warn them freehand. You know, when you talk about drugs, when you talk about financial uh, uh, transactions, when you talk about terrorism, it kind of is in your uh, entire life uh, span. Like everything is controlled by these things. So uh, intelligence is a thing which affects every layman at every point because when your administration makes these decisions, it kind of is to protect uh, the citizens. So they are very you know, important. I think they, they, um, a couple of thoughts come to mind when you when you talk about that. Number one is um, that they have a lot of data to work with. You know, there's enormous amount. Social networking analysis is an art form that started probably right after 9-11. I want to mention that. And, um, you know, the, the government, whatever agency it is, has tons and tons and tons of data. They get from telephones, from emails, from um, black search warrants, if you will, uh, from uh, people who, uh, you know, are, are agents in the field, uh, people who um, are, um, what you call it, uh, that they, they speak, they are sources of one kind or another. Um, <clears throat> and there's so much stuff that it must be overwhelming. The social network analysis was done with computers, and you throw a whole bunch of data in the computer, and it tells you what's important. Um, but I'm not sure that that, that kind of uh, you know, uh, computer processing has kept up with the, the virtual amount of information. It's huge. 
And so we have mistakes. 9-11 was a mistake. The first attack on the World Trade Center was a mistake. They failed to, you know, to know about that. Um, there's, you know, I mean, gee, Oklahoma City bombing, they failed to know about that. Um, and there's all kinds of examples I could give you about where, where intelligence agencies failed. And they failed in 1973 in the attack uh, on the Yom Kippur War in Israel. They failed, obviously, on October 7th this past year. So you know, what we have is, um, you know, two visions here. One is the vision we get uh, from the media, which tells us that these intelligence agencies really know what they're doing. I think a lot of that is fiction. I'm sorry. Um, and then we get these things that slip through the net where the intelligence agencies have no idea what's coming down the pike. You know, they have effectively an unlimited budget. They have lots of judicial power or mm -hmm, um, outside a judicial power um, to find things out. Um, but, you know, they, they miss a lot. They miss the big ones. And, I, you know, it's, it's, you have these two competing concepts. One is uh, in the media um, with the, you know, fiction programs, TV, movies, what have you. They seem to be all powerful. But in the real world, they're not all powerful. Can you help me with that? Yeah, Jay, uh, like you said, it's a lot of information, processing of the information, and what goes to the policymakers is at the discretion of the, these intelligence agencies. That's why the word itself, that intelligence, how much they can process it and how much they can vet it. So uh, uh, this is very important, and their failure occurs because too many things at one time uh, bring on to them. Uh, and uh, Jay, we can understand the importance of these intelligence agencies by the kind of budget that these people have. Around 7% of the American budget is for the intelligence agencies. And you know what it is known as? It is known as the black budget. So beyond that line, we know nothing about what is in the budget, who it goes to, what it is done. It is classified, pure classified information. So uh, around 7% of the American budget going someplace, uh, it must be very important. And failures of this kind are uh, so natural, Jay, because we, we know through all our programs that uh, terror attacks and uh, um, attacks on democracy are so far, uh, so many, and they are not, there's no break in between them. So kind of uh, to protect uh, the institution, uh, institution, the infrastructure from these attacks is the entire um, uh, burden or responsibility of these intelligence agencies. So it's overwhelming for them. And these failures, I mean, a small failure can lead to such big attacks that is that that actually shows how many they must have processed and how many they must have blocked. So if we go to see in that way, uh, it is a whole new ball game, Jay, that one or two failures have led to such big catastrophes, the ones you mentioned. Imagine if we did not have the intelligence agencies, if we did not have the sources to back up or sources to warn us of these uh, attacks. You know, there is uh, cell phone trafficking, there is uh, uh, email, your emails are uh, blocked. How, about how many in a day each person sends like social media or any post or anything? You know, it's millions and millions. The vastness is too much. So, uh, to find a culprit in that is a huge task. And these agencies work for it. That is that is a bigger thing. So that way. Yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, I was saying before that I didn't think the technology kept up with the with the sheer volume of data. Um, and, and that the Israelis made a remember this a couple of years ago? They made a program that could um, uh, listen to your cell phone and all the traffic on your cell phone, even when it was off, even when you didn't know about it. And, and they're expensive, but you could buy it. A country could buy it, and, and they could track you around and find out everything you're doing. So, you know, that that is even greater information, a greater volume of information now. So, you know, any prudent uh, intelligence agency is going to have waves and waves of information at the same time. In the past couple of years, we've seen AI, and AI can use that in a large language model or even a small one, and they can get social network analysis on you, and uh, they can, if they find certain markers, they can decide that um, you're a spy, you're a terrorist, whatever it is, 
and they can start following you with, with greater intensity. So, you know, I, I, I was saying, I was thinking that we don't have the technology to track all the data, to, you know, uh, you know interpret it, as you said. Um, but on the other hand, we do have a lot of really sophisticated AI technology. And I'm just wondering whether the government is using it as, as much as uh, Microsoft and, uh, you know, and, and all the other, uh, and, and, and Google and all the other big tech companies that are investing billions and billions into it. And it seems to be a, 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 a split here. You know, you have the private tech companies who are using this to make big bucks, and you have the government and query whether the private companies are working for the government, whether the government has the capacity to develop AI programs. Certainly it has the money, you know, the, the money that you don't see in the budget, that money. Um, and it has the data uh, and query whether, whether it's bringing those two things together. Um, I demand, I expect our intelligence agencies will be able to use this modern technology and protect me, protect all of us. Um, are they? And furthermore, are they sharing it with countries that need it? For example, you know, in the um, attack on uh, Israel on October 7th, was there collaboration between the U.S. and Israel, between the U.K. and Israel? Because it doesn't matter where you are. You can get this data anywhere. In the world, you can get it. And you can interpret it anywhere. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is whether they're sharing, because sometimes they don't, we, as we have found, they don't share. That program you spoke about with spies on the phone and all that, Jay Pegasus, uh, that one, uh, which was developed by Israel uh, on, it was a big thing which came in. And uh, it was like right on the personal level it could take. Now this uh, uh, issue, Jay, of sharing uh, intelligence and all that, we know that America warned Russia of a terror attack uh, so many days in advance. But the Moscow terror attack happened because, you know, what decision happens at the policy making level is at the end what, uh, what is at prime. And, uh, you know, Russia, huge thing, huge uh, fighting a war. And you get intelligence uh, that there's going to be a terror attack. Now, where do you control this terror attack, on which place there is, you know, it's, uh, the vastness of the uh, implementation is what hurts it. And not knowing where the, uh, the precision is not that much, it's just a blind arrow, uh, arrow in the dark and saying that, you know, there will be a terror attack. Something is going to happen, but where is going to happen, how is it going to happen, that is, that is a matter of what action takes place in reality. So it's like uh, an astrologer's uh, uh, 10 day. They just predict something will happen, but what will happen, when will happen is uh, a different ball game. Yeah, well, you're, <laughs> so, you're, talking, you're talking about um, mathematical processes with par yeah. prognostications and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where you, 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 probabilities, probability analysis. So I give you a possibility, and now you have to do two things. One, you have to test on authenticity, you have to test on reliability, and there are ways to do that, you know, using the same technology coming in from another angle, another perspective. <clears throat> you can determine, um, you know, how reliable is this information? Because, I mean, I think, I think Russia decided that if they got anything from the U.S. about that attack in the theater, um, it wasn't reliable because they don't trust the U.S. That's, that's the way Putin is. Um, at the same time, you know, he could have had a better thought process and realized that this was valuable. And, and so we should have that too. We should have the ability to test for reliability, test for probability, um, and, and act. And of course, then you have the problem of government itself. You know, Putin makes all the decisions. That's an autocracy. But in the U.S., we have call it a democracy. And one of the problems about democracies is Nobody knows who's in charge at the bureaucratic level. So you can get information about 9-11 or the previous attack on the World Trade Center, and it doesn't go to the right place. And so you have to have dissemination systems. And then, of course, you have spies within the intelligence agencies. And be very careful that it doesn't go to them. And, and then you have to be very careful it's not false flag. I mean, the whole thing is a, is a study in credibility. And so we have to take all this technology, the AI, what, what have you, and we have to turn that into 
a test of credibility. This is not easy. I'm sure somebody's working on this, um, but but the reality is right now it's not perfected, in my opinion. Uh, so right, Jay, so right. Uh, you know, where this spy on what are the sources is such a matter of uh, debate all the time. Have you seen that uh, uh, clip where uh, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg is covering his um, computer uh, camera and the microphone? He's covering it with tape. So that kind of intrusion the intelligence agencies do have. Everything is listening and everything is watching. But how much it is watching, where it is watching, and where this information goes is the point, Jay. And uh, Jay, uh, you have these, you know, uh, agencies which uh, design this intelligence gathering uh, systems. They find the sources. They they uh, nurture the sources. You have double spies, double agents who work for both sides of uh, uh, for two countries. You know, you have complications in this information gathering. So it's not just basic information gathering and you put it into an Excel sheet and you get data and graphs and everything. It is so much information that comes in from all the sources and uh, to uh, classify it as what is important, what is not, and what will be of vitality to policymakers is the uh, trick of these intelligence agencies. And, you know, it, it's um, the, like, let's go to the top five uh, agencies that we have in the world. First is the Central Intelligence Agency, that the CIA, and uh, they uh, they rely on uh, human it means human intelligence more than anything else. And uh, they 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 literally have uh, you know this the recruitment is so secret. They are picked up you know you they, they, they are stories that they are picked up at high school level. And uh, the CIA agents are trained to such an extent that they can even defeat a polygraphic test. So uh, you, it's like how an astronaut is trained. That kind of, you know, dedication to training an astronaut is the kind of dedication that they put into training a CIA agent. He has to face any test at any time. Then you have the MI6, that is the Military Intelligence uh, Section Six, that is of the uh, UK, the Britain. Uh, a unit and you know it was all made famous by the Bond movies. He's a zero o seven uh, spy, so uh, uh, you know what kind of you know uh, things that they go through. Then you have the Federal Security Agency, which is a successor of the uh, Committee of State Security, the KGB. USSR's KGB has become now the Federal Security Service. Then you have the uh, Research and Analysis Wing of RAW of India, Jay. And it's established uh, um, 1968 due to failures of India-China war. And uh, it's relatively new, but it's very effective this, um, and because the recruitment is through civil services, already a very hard process. And then you have Mossad, which was the Hamosad Nimodinil Taktim Mayukdim. That is the Institute for Intelligence and Special Operations. So Mossad is one of the most lethal intelligence agencies in the world. So when you hear these names, you know, you know that they are very uh, hard hitters. Hard hitters in the sense that they literally put these countries which I spoke to, all are on the war front. Everybody's facing, facing antagonistic uh, uh, rivals. They have these intelligence agencies which protect and serve them 24-7. Because uh, they're not some uh, out of 202 countries, they're not some, uh, just another country. They're all on vulnerable points. So uh, the importance of intelligence agencies is elevated in this sense that they play a vital role in the security of a sovereign nation. And these, these five nations are always uh, in the news because they're facing threats, they're facing terror attacks. All of them have faced terror attacks. Each one, uh, not once, not twice, but on a recurring basis. So we understand the importance of these intelligence agencies in drugs, terrorism, uh, radicalism, financing, you know, uh, everything. And policy yeah, making. Cyber, cyber terrorism, too. Cyber terrorism. Yeah, For you're, sure. you're, 
Yeah, you know, a couple of reactions to all of that. You know, the people in intelligence agencies, A, um, sometimes they have 007 kind of license to kill, and they do kill our instruction, uh, maybe sometimes without instruction, with, with poison. Navalny was killed by intelligence agencies under Putin's control and all that. Uh, I mean, his poisoning and ultimately his death. Um, and then and then you have the notion that if you are an intelligence uh, agent, if you're a spy, you're at great risk. And that's why the identity of the spy has to be very carefully protected. And remember that spy, I think it was George Bush, W. Bush, uh, revealed a, a spy because he had political, mm, uh, political aggravations with the spy, decided he would um, reveal that spy, a woman, I forget her name right now. And uh, that was really awful. She wound up suing the government because she had been uh, at great risk. And so any spy, anybody involved in the field now, okay, just like in the movies, is at risk of getting killed. Uh, who? By who? Intelligence agency. So the intelligence agencies, you know, sort of control life and death over the other ones. That's, that's very troublesome. The other point I make, um, you know, just based on your comments a minute ago, is that the intelligence agencies are not only interested in knowing what, what the government, the other government is doing or plans to do, what secret memos and all that. It's also interested in knowing how the other intelligence agencies work. Uh, and, and they want to get in there and find out who exactly who is a spy, who is working in what office and their family and their wives and daughters and the pets' names and everything. Uh, so, you know, if you're in that community, you're you're not only going to be known to your own agency, you're going to be known to all the other competing agencies, and that puts you at risk. And one of the things that's come up not too long ago, in fact, repeatedly, um, is this notion of microwaves uh, to, to injure you and to injure your family uh, in various American embassies around the world. Um, there's some kind of technology that can and this is undoubtedly uh, an intelligence operation where they want to target certain people because those people are in sensitive jobs and they want to you know, neutralize them somehow. So what you have is a whole underpinning, a whole underworld, if you will, of intelligence people competing with each other, spying on each other, sometimes killing each other or otherwise neutralizing each other. It's a rough time. The, other, the last point I want to make just listening to your comments, Rupani, is that it, it's harder and harder to get people in the field for those reasons, to, to recruit intelligently. When you have to pay somebody whose life is always on the line, who, who there are people sworn to kill or neutralize that person. So what is that worth in terms of a salary or a retirement? Gee whiz, I mean, uh, it ought to be a, a lot. But also, there's a lot of people who are not going to do that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. It's not like they graduate college and run off to you join a, the CIA so they can get out in the field. Um, no, they don't do that. And so the result is that, as far as I can see, more and more intelligence work is done by computer. It's done by mm, satellites and spying technology and you know cyber cyber systems rather than having people engaging on the ground. What have you found about that? Yeah, Jay, uh, this, uh, the source knowing too much and uh, not being uh, beneficial to the, so uh, to the intelligence agency itself puts the source at risk. So the agents have to be very careful in how much they, you know, uh, how much information they give, how much information they get. These are double agents, they are undercover, like you said, uh, so they work underground and, you know, they don't, ha they are not covert officers or covert administrative wing. They are supposed to do underground work and uh, nobody has to know what they are doing and they, they don't have to know more than they have to know. That is also there. If they know more than they have to know, they will also be eliminated. So it's kind of uh, really like a movie system where if the spy knows too much, they will be eliminated and they will be done with. So it's uh, the risk involved with uh, being a part of the intelligence agencies also plays a big, big role in. Uh, but recruitment of, I think, these agents is done on selection rather than, you know, choice. So uh, you don't uh, really choose to be, they pick you 
based on your intelligence or based on your profiles uh, and see how much you can help the government or what use you can be. And cyber crime, uh, cyber terrorism, Jay, we know the kind of uh, hackers uh, that there are, you know, who can uh, hack into your systems. And you have counter hackers which are employed by governments to uh, uh, form an offensive against those hackers. So, you know, this kind of uh, virtual game is an all new different ball game because you have uh, hackers recruited at such a high uh, uh, pay level that if they were regular hackers, they would have just been, you know, hacking some websites, but they are hired by uh, government agencies to uh, keep a uh, uh, tab on how the counter-offensive hackers of other nations are uh, coming into their system. So it's a very complicated case in that that way. Too. And, you know, uh, I, mean, hmm. I, I was thinking also that there's got to be a, a whole element of um, um, intelligence which sets up noise, noise, because that that's how the Israelis um, made the mistake they made. You know, they failed to act. They failed to uh, appreciate their intelligence uh, for the Yom Kippur War, 1973, and again for October 7th. They were getting all kinds of intelligence, um, but it was noise. They were getting terror threats, but there were so many terror threats. You know what it's like? It's like sending all the missiles from Iran, mm. you know, to Israel. You send tons of them. You send hundreds of them in the thought that the Iron Dome won't, won't have the capacity to deal with them all. And that, I think, is the theory that they, they used in attacking Israel in 73 and in 2023. That is, you send all this noise, you create too many threats for the system, as you understand it, to deal with those threats. And then one day you fake them out. It's, it's a fake out. You, you fake them out and you actually really attack. But meanwhile, you've been sending them threats all along. And most all of them, except one, is a false threat. This, this has got to be part of the package, no? So true, Jay, so true. You know, uh, like uh, Crying Wolf, that story it comes up to, isn't it? Uh, you never know what is the exact point. So that's why I'm, I told you that Russia must have ignored this kind of uh, warning from the U.S. that there is going to be a terror attack. But where, when, how, that becomes the kind of uh, issue for uh, these people. Jay. It's very, very difficult to understand. And the intelligence agencies, what kind of hardliners they are and what kind of agents they produce, we can understand that Putin is one of the best examples of a spy turned president of Russia, and he had got you know a, a, a disintegrated USSR at USSR at his disposal, and to make it you know they are so fanatic about their own country, they will talk about Russia, Russia, Russia. He wants the lost glory. You know they stay in the bubble of their own. Also, if we analyze Putin as an example, you see that the kind of uh, hardliner attitude that they have. It's just the country. And that that works for them. And yeah. Israel was uh, Israel was at the receiving end, like you said, it was a bombardment of uh, false alarms, and one one of them hurt. So yeah. that, that was the problem. But that made uh, Israel alert on so many different fronts. Now, when you see all these uh, 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 protests on the campuses, Jay, uh, and you see. Uh, there must be so many people who are collecting information about who, what, how many, what is the level of protest, who is doing the funding. All these things are being gathered because they will help not today, but in the future to prevent such things. You know? Yes. It's a yes, constant, you, constant they, process that happens. They, they, didn't, they didn't really know what was going to happen, though. And, exactly. and if the intelligence had been good, I mean, I believe, I believe that this is, now, not organic. It, it didn't, you know, emerge in a sort of natural, organic way that somebody was organizing these protests. Look what's happening now. It's going from campus to campus. You know, this has happened before. Um, but, you know, I, I suggest to you that there are people who are coordinating this kind of thing. And <clears throat> if our intelligence systems were really robust, we would know in advance. 
I, I don't think we did in this case. I think it's all a big surprise. I want to mention in the, in the context of our conversation is a movie, a serial that I saw a year or two ago. Um, uh, I don't know, this is fiction, of course, but and there is some truth in fiction, you know, um, and it was called The Americans. And um, in rev you know, reading reviews of, of that series, you get the feeling that this is not just fiction, that it's fiction about something, a phenomenon that actually happens. The Americans was a story about a, an American family that was not an American family. Um, they lived somewhere in the East Coast. Um, they were both Russians. Uh, they had children. Uh, they were ostensibly married, although the marriage was a, a false marriage um, to shield their uh, true identities. They spoke excellent English. They had they had a persona. They had life stories that were entirely credible, and yet they were born, raised trained and sent from Russia. And they lived in the United States for decades. That's that's in, you know, the movie, the series. But I think there are stories where that same kind of thing happened and it was not fiction anymore. It was true. And so, you know, you have these embedded spies living in this country. I suppose I'd like to think that there are American embedded spies on the other side of the coin living in other countries. But I'm not so I'm not so confident of that, but but I believe that there are embedded Russian spies and Chinese spies, for that matter, uh, who who live in this country and whose you know secret mission is to do espionage uh, and report home. Um, and and I think this movie brings it brings it, it true. We we just don't know exactly who they are, or how to follow them. They make every effort to stay under wraps. Have you looked at that? It's uh, I've not seen this, uh, the uh, Americans, but uh, I think what I hear from you is that it's a complicated uh, uh, situation and this counteroffensive that they have. They have two two sides of the coin, uh, and these agents have to give and take information from each other. Um, I, I don't know how much you know uh, they work towards um, being. Together, how many? How many? You know, do they have these alliances amongst themselves? If Russia and China are friends in the geopolitical world, are the agents going to support each other, or do they exchange information, or do they work in collaboration with each, with each other? This is another set of uh, relationships that come uh, into play. Jay, that will they work together? Will there be uh, operations in which agents of two countries come together and you know create one offensive? Or, you know, you have uh, uh, allies over there. Or do they each individually work themselves? So the world, they have a different uh, world amongst themselves, if you if you go to see. And uh, uh, they do have complications, like we say. What is happening on the na nation level happens at the agent level also. I think that is the situation everywhere. Complications of human behavior, they go through every level. So, so, you know, I, one question comes to mind is that, you know, when, when you have a country like China where, um, you know, you're going to have a certain amount of intelligence and espionage going on, and we know they, they do things and then deny it, or Russia, same thing, um, and, and Russia is, you know, somehow more brutal in some ways. I, I couldn't make, make, make a, a comparison. but. Hmm, it seems to me those autocracies have a better shot at controlling their agents, at intelligence, because they can be more brutal with their own people. Um, and they're not so mm, concerned about bureaucracy and human rights and, um, and, and legal rights, uh, employment law, for example, you know, um, where the United States and any democracy has to cope with matters of transparency, matters of accountability, matters of mm, administrative law and employment law and all that. So I, I throw at you this premise, this notion, uh, Ramadia, that if you're a democracy, you have more trouble conducting intelligence than if you're an autocracy. Do you agree? Not very right. Very, very right. What you speak about is absolute facts. And in an autocracy, uh, it is just the dictator of the uh, one at the helm. 
But in a democracy, you're answerable to so many people. Now, like we said, the budget, uh, the, uh, the black budget, which is classified, how many petitions are being filed to tell us what it is, why it is, who is it being spent on? There are constant uh, petitions in the Supreme Court. There are constant petitions in the Congress that we want to know what is in that budget because it is our spending. So this kind of questions that come in democracy are the ones that hurt most. It. While in an autocracy, if the, uh, the, uh, the leader says that this much has gone to this, there is no question. The Communist Party will never question uh, Xi about what he is doing. Uh, it will just be, it's done. And nobody can do anything about it. So North Korea, what agents they uh, uh, deploy or what agents they eliminate is never a matter of uh, questioning in the public domain. But in a democracy, everything happens in the public domain. And intelligence is something which is never in the public domain. So that is the uh, conflict that happens in between these two chains. So does this, th I get the picture, um, you can correct me, of, of a world that is filled with intelligence, all trying to um, find out what the other guy is doing. Um, a world where um, no communication is really sacrosanct. It's very hard to uh, remain confidential about anything. You know, you, we've seen we've seen all the breaches of classified information in this country. I mean, Trump. You know, he had no respect uh, for any of the documents that he uh, stole from the White House. Uh, and that mm -hmm. that kid in the National Guard who was sending it on uh, on the internet for fun. Uh, he's gone to jail, by the way. Um, you know, it's, we have so many. When I was in the service, to have a top secret clearance was a big deal. Now there are virtually, I'm telling you, millions of people in the service who have top secret clearances. Uh, are we safer with that? No, it can't be. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that the world is just brimming and broiling with all this intelligence going back and forth. And my question to you, this is not an easy question. Are you ready for a difficult question? And with all of this, um, these connections or mm, contentions between con intelligence agencies of various countries, including, you know, big, big powers and also small powers, um, does it make the world safer? Um, it, and, and assuming they get smarter and smarter, uh, is the world going to be safer in the future by virtue of these intelligence agencies? Or or is it something that's not helping anyone? <laughs> I just wonder if it's helping anyone. Okay, can you help me with that? Jay, what about the question? <laughs> the, the, the people, the uh, information that these intelligence agencies get, you know, the source can be of fruit sellers, the source can be a shopkeeper. Every agency has got these departments. Departments have got these agents, spies, sub-spies, uh, double agents, all these things. Uh, ocean of information. How much they protect is a matter of uh, debate, and arguably they do protect because, Jay, the enemy has gotten stronger and the enemy has gotten into, uh, uh, gotten hold of these modern technologies which they counter the uh, government uh, government agencies with that much only vigor, as much as the agencies, you know, they deploy. Suppose it takes effort to uh, recruit and train one CIA agent, you know, in that much time, ISIS will recruit thousand people who will, you know, tie suicide belts and come onto your house. So that's the kind of competition these agencies face. And that's the reality that this world is living in today. You can have, you know, you can have terror happening at any level, any stage and anywhere. You know, just a couple of hours ago, I saw a Jewish man being hit by a Palestine student. They're pulling his hair, they're pulling his uh, bag, and that girl has got a taser in her hand. Now, where did she get the taser from? Is she allowed to have, uh, only police uh, authorities are supposed to have tasers. Can she use it? It can be dangerous. So all these things, you know, terrorism has become very personal. It attacks you on any level. But our agencies do work at every level. But for them, it's more difficult because, like you said a while ago, they do have these democratic checks on them. 
they're not free to recruit to move to the to function as much as terrorism is autocratic agencies are under democratic uh, control so you know, it strikes me from this discussion that that we have a war going on among yes. the intelligence agencies that you were talking about um, and they're they're fighting for information um, they're fighting to diminish the other guy's opportunity to get information from them or about them. Um, it's like um, this is it's under the hood, but it's a war. And, and maybe it has as much effect as a Connecticut war, kinetic war on the battlefield, because ultimately information is power and intelligence is all about information. And the one thing, the other thing I get, and, and I guess we'll have to close after a while, but um, it's this. It's that, you know, Trump, uh, even through counsel in front of the Supreme Court, has said that, uh, that he, he feels uh, that he has immunity to kill his adversaries, to kill anybody who opposes him. But he, you know, in that circumstance, he would be the president, with the power of the presidency. And how is he going to identify his adversaries? How is he going to kill them? Well, he's going to use intelligence agencies. So if you were an autocrat, a dictator, a madman, if you will, um, then you can use the same tools to check up on your adversaries and to actually undo them, neutralize them uh, in some way or another, even if you're the president, especially if you're the president, uh, like, like Trump, of, of, of a demo ostensibly a, a, a democratic country. So I think there's two sides to all this. What they learn under the hood, what they learn you know, in the black box court and all that, what they learn um, for purposes of national defense and national security in the hands of a madman um, could be used for all the wrong reasons. That's what he's saying. Um, and, and so this intelligence thing could be hugely destructive on a domestic level. Your thoughts? Yeah, Jay. He, uh, you know, uh, the word that comes to my mind is megalomaniac. Uh, which was used a uh, long time back for uh, uh, people like Osama and all these, they, they're out of control. They think that their power can be used to destroy, to uh, turn things uh, completely into their way. Now, uh, what happened, you know, at uh, the Congress, the White House, uh, sorry, the Capitol Hill, uh, uh, you know, raiding, you know, he's going to go after every person who went against him because this uh, this term that is it's about vengeance. It's not about it's about turning back the table of what happened in the last four years. Uh, entire presidency is going to be about that. How to turn it back to before? And he is going to use these intelligence agencies to go after people. He cannot go out in the open. His court operations are going to be far uh, more than what we imagine. Okay, I, I, we're we're about out of time, but I, I'm I'm um, I, I need to tell you a short story on the way out. Okay, back back in the day, twenty years ago, on Think Tech, we we had a, a guest by the name of Jack Balkan. Balkan is like the dean of constitutional law at Yale, and um, I asked him that question. I said, you know, uh, what do we do after a bad administration in Washington, after a bad president? We have to reel it back to the way it was before. We have to try to, you know, get back to the, the good old days where, it, you know, it was, it was fair and decent and democratic. And he said, no, Jay, you have to understand. This is really profound. And it left a mark on me all this time. Hmm. You have to understand that history always moves forward. And that if somebody acts badly, that's part of history. And you can't unring that bell. It's always going to be part of history. So yes, you know, you can get to a better president, but you can't go back. You can't go home again. It always moves forward, and it's built into the future. Sorry to have to tell you that, Ruth Body. Yeah. No, it's correct. It's correct. It's so correct. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> well, thank you, Ruth Body. Ruth Kondakar, our geopolitical strategist, discussing. Uh, so many issues and uh, concerns about the intelligence community in various countries around the world and, and how those uh, intelligence agencies uh, 
affect our lives and our future. Thank you so much, Ruth Mani. Thank you for having me, Jay. Aloha. 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 We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, Please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.